Thank you very much. And uh, one of the reasons uh, I'm using my own laptop is I'm going to try to do a live demo. Uh, so also wake you up. So, um, so uh, yes, my name is Louis Philippe. Uh, I'm usually really loud. Um, so Louis Philippe LP. Uh, what I will be presenting is a shared vision with a lot of what we've seen up to now. But I will try to emphasize the multimodal and do in this uh, few slides a tutorial on multimodal AI uh, because you hear a lot about AI, deep learning, and machine learning. Uh, but before I go there, I want to share some of the discovery we've done. I started working on healthcare six years ago, and uh, uh, a lot of our early work and if you think about emotion, that's what we are. We are sharing our emotion early on, our sadness, happiness, surprise. Emotion are, in fact, central of all of our interaction, family, parents, siblings, friends, and colleagues. And so when we are collaborating with them, when we're communicating with them, we're doing it through the three V of communication, trademark, uh, verbal, vocal, and visual, what you say, how you say it, and the gesture and facial expression that go with it. Uh, this is, at the end, what we want to do is build software or computers that can interact with humans, so they need to also be able to understand these three V of communication. And so multimodal AI is a subset of AI that studies this uh, problem. What's really exciting here is that, in fact, this is the right time to study this. Uh, when I started studying it in 2000, it was the wrong time to study it. Um, <laughs> Now we have very good sensing technology that can perceive detailed changes in the face. Uh, we have much better speech recognition that understand the words. And as was mentioned, speech was probably the one that had been studied the best and, knew, and we knew a lot about it, but still we got a lot of progress recently. And so now, and this is just uh, for, because it was talk about open source, if you want to build your own uh, tracker, uh, open face is open source, and I decided to not be rich. So that's, I give everything open source, uh, and not just the real time, but also how to train everything about training the model. So if you want to do your, please use it, you're free. But the vision we have is the idea of, uh, uh, of being able to passively pick up on these behavioral cues. So as the patient is interacting with uh, either a human therapist or as uh, uh, Justin mentioned, a virtual interviewer. Aha, very important. All of the journalists we talk to, they all say virtual shrink, virtual doctor, and all this. It is a virtual interviewer. It is there to gather information, not make any diagnosis. I personally will be uh, scared about having a computer do a diagnosis for me, but no, this is there to gather the information for you. As the person is interacting with the patient, then we get the uh, multi-sense, which is our software, pick up on the verbal, vocal, and visual cue that then goes back uh, to the doctor who can do the diagnosis. We're looking at it in a human-in-the-loop perspective where at the end of the day what we have is that you have a measure of how is the person behaving today versus maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, and be able to compare this with a population, a reference population, so that at the end you get these behavior markers. So I said over six years, now we have a dictionary of about 22 to 25 behavior markers that goes from depression, anxiety, PTSD, schizophrenia, and suicidal ideation. I would like to uh, share with you four of them uh, discoveries that we've made over the years. The first one was about depression and smile. That sounded so much the most obvious one. People who are depressed most likely smile less often uh, than people who are not depressed. That was a nice cross-sectional analysis, uh, and that was over 150 patients. Surprisingly, the number was at almost exactly the same. The number of smiles was almost exactly the same. What changed 
is the dynamic of the smile. Shorter smile, less amplitude. Because probably of social norm, people ended up smiling, but they probably don't feel it, so they, their dynamic change. That was really interesting. The second one was about trauma. The trauma in this case was either military trauma or other type of trauma. And we were looking at one aspect of negative expression. And we again expected people with trauma to have more negative expression. As you probably expect, given my previous slide, is yes, surprisingly, the, the negative expression was about the same between PTSD and non-PTSD. But we separated men and women. And what did we see in our analysis? A crossover interaction. Men with PTSD, more negative expression. Women with PTSD, less uh, negative expression. This is very interesting. This crossover interaction here, gender and, and facial expression, is interesting. Now, why? That's a future interesting research question. But our hypothesis is our, again social norm or more cultural norm. Uh, maybe in the American uh, culture, women are, expect, are allowed or are most expected to be more happy. Maybe men are allowed to be more negative. That's one hypothesis. The other one is all these people are from Los Angeles. That's another possibility. Uh, so we'll have to study that. Uh, but this is an example. The third one is probably the most uh, touching of all the examples, is suicidal behavior versus non-suicidal. This was a work with Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And we wanted to do two things. The first one is looking at suicidal. And as you probably know, the number of patients going to the ER, and this was just looking at teenagers in Cincinnati Children's Hospital. The number is already 40 teenagers a week going to the ER for suicidal ideation. And so the doctors have to make this hard decision. Do I keep them, put them on medication, on therapy? So we want to look at the behavior markers. And one of them was, what do they say? So the word they say, and that was studied also, uh, uh, what was described just earlier with the words, uh, uh, with uh, Penny Baker, is that the, they use more personal pronouns. That is me and myself, and that was more for societal. But the more interesting is the repeaters versus the non-repeaters. That is really where we want to go. And that was interesting because the voice turned out to be a very interesting and it was a little bit counterintuitive. We expected that people who had really tense voice will be the one more likely. They're almost angry. They, they like, but they will be the more likely. But no, the people with the bratty voice, they made their mind most likely, and they were the most likely to do a uh, repeat. So the fourth one is looking at psychosis and schizophrenia, specifically gaze aversion and voice patterns. And for that, I will invite you to talk to my students. Not because of psychosis or schizophrenia themselves, but they are doing research and they will show two posters uh, this evening. Uh, they can talk to you about this, uh, both on the gaze aversion and the voice pattern. So these were just a summary of all the behavior markers. A lot of them are individual in their modality. And now we want to fuse this. So this is where I want to do is take all these indicators so that you can get something like this at the end. What do we have here? This is on a test set where you have 100 patients all uh, ordered uh, by their level of uh, symptoms. This is, uh, in, in this case, PHQ-9. Uh, in this case, PHQ-9. So you can see here people with high uh, um, on the scale and low. And the green are the uh, prediction from the multimodal fusion. So how do you do multimodal AI? And for you, I have this wonderful paper to may help you fall asleep tonight. 24 pages of extensive description of all the last two years. It took two years writing this paper on multimodal machine learning. The reason for that is that there is a lot of interest in machine learning itself. But multimodal brings five main challenges that has been understudied in other fields of machine learning. Representation. How do you bring this information in one coherent representation or multiple coordinated representation? Alignment between modalities. Fusion to predict eventually an outcome. 
or translation or co-learning that are also very important. So to help you, I'm going to give you one example. So uh, put on your mat hat for a second, but I want to motivate why would you care on multimodal and why the three V of communication are so important. We'll do a simple thing. Is it positive or negative emotion? That seems like the most easy thing for multimodal fusion. And then I give you behaviors and I say, from this behavior, tell me if it's positive or negative. The movie is sick. In the US, the movie is sick could be positive or negative. <laughs> That's a really cool thing. Uh, so it is ambiguous in itself. The movie is fair. It's probably somewhat positive. A smile is probably somewhat positive. Being loud, I can be really angry loud and really happy loud. And so this is also really ambiguous. So unimodal doesn't give you all of this information. But then let's look at what's called bimodal, two modalities together. The movie is sick and I'm smiling. This gives you a lot of information that allows you to solve the problem of unimodal. But sometimes you can say the movie is sick and being really loud and still being ambiguous because of the two cues by itself. This is where trimodal comes in. <laughs> Aha! If I say the movie is sick, I smile and I loud, that is probably very good. But if I say the movie is fair, even if I smile as much as you want, even if I'm loud as much as you want, Language in this case takes over all of the other cues. And if it was not for this, multimodal fusion would have been so easy because they're just adding each other. But no, unfortunately, it is, there's non what's called nonlinearity. That, that language is somehow taking over the other modality. And that's what makes multimodal fusion challenging. So uh, if you want to solve that, I'm just giving you this beautiful uh, algorithm. But if you want to solve this, one way to do this is neural network. Yes, we, I, I drank the Kool-Aid. Um, so neural networks are good for certain tasks, and I'll be happy to discuss that in the later stage. But this is just to give you an example of representation where unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal interaction are all explicitly created and represented. So, and so, as I mentioned, this is if you want to have the long taxonomy of multimodal fusion. So I said I will do for you a live demo. Uh, so I did my prayer to the god of demo earlier. <laughs> so what you will see here, this is more what the doctor or clinician should be seeing. These are the behavior markers. This is only five of them. The first two, I think, are for depression, PTSD, uh, forgot, uh, this is maybe anxiety. Um, and this is, what you will see is my beautiful face with a lot of marker and also uh, lasers you see also. And this is, uh, you see here the uh, facial expression, the head pose, and the, um, we'll have the gaze and the, uh, also the voice. And so what shot? Okay, so uh, what you see here is what we'll just say a little bit closer. Um, so what you see in real time, so I will be smiling, uh, uh, frowning, uh, surprise, raise, and then I told you about the real laser. <laughs> Okay, uh, so all of this information is in real time. So now, in a normal conversation, the, the, the patient does not see this. Uh, you, the, yeah, the patient does not see all this information, but in fact, what they see, the doctor will see, is the behavior indicator in the real time. These don't change quickly. They should not. If they change quickly, that will be a little bit worrisome. These are accumulation of evidence over time. And that's what is used. So right now, so I will stop uh, this. And because um, because Justin mentioned uh, Ellie, I will introduce you Ellie. Uh, Ellie is a virtual interviewer, uh, and so. Oh, we should stop. So you will not hear, but if you Google Sim Sensei, uh, you can meet Ellie, who will be. 
uh, happy to discuss with you at some point. So thank you very much for your attention.